Hello, everybody. Ooh, that's loud. Turn that down just a little bit. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Luke Thomas. Today is uh, October 2nd, 2013. The camera's going to be a little off-center because, as you can see, this light on this light here, it's been making my face go dark. Not that my face is the most important thing in the world, I'd just be kind of weird to not see it. Anyway, um, this is the weekly MMA fighting live chat. <clears throat> Pardon me. Off to a bit of a rough start. Um, today on the live chat, obviously we get to all your questions, comments, gripes, bitches, and smart-ass remarks, but we also answer all your questions. And you can give me those questions on MMAfighting.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I probably won't get to it. Twitter, I might get to it. And if you use the hashtag chat rappers, uh, I can try to get to it. But the best place definitely is on MMAfighting.com. The comments with three the comments that, with three recommendations that turn green get priority. Um, let's see. A couple of favors to ask before we do anything else. If you're watching this on YouTube or on MMA Fighting, give this window a big thumbs up. In addition, um, let folks know you're watching. Get on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Google+, Instagram, Vine, wherever it is that you use, and let folks know you're watching. That's the best thing you can do. Help spread the word and do it right now. Don't wait. Even if you're not watching this live and you're watching this two days from now, whenever you see this message, let folks know. Just link it up this thing. Use the hashtag. You know how to do it. Um, and um, I don't think there's much more than that. You know, try not to be uh, an uncivilized d-bag in the comments, so I don't have to ban you permanently. But other than that, man, we should be good. I'll be trying to shorten these um, intros. Today is brought to you by. I mean, it's not brought to you by. I shouldn't say that, but that was what's in the office fridge. It's gross. All right. Let's see here. Yeah. All right. So everyone is going to be real bitter at me about what I'm about to say here. But uh, first question. What do you make of Danny's excuse of Okama? Oh, excuse me, Okama of Okami being a gatekeeper in his cut when the UFC has dozens of gatekeepers just like Okami? So, um, if I'm going to do the MMA beat tomorrow, um, which means it'll be out Friday. I'm returning to the MMA beat. If, uh, if you watch that on Friday, this what, you, what, I, what you're about to hear now will sound familiar. Because I'm going to say what I'm saying now, and I'm going to repeat that on Friday. Because not everyone watches those, these chats. Not everyone who watches the beat watches the chat, and you get the idea. So if you're asking me, like, in a, in, a, in a week where Tim Kennedy has been announced that he's going to be fighting uh, Rafael Natal, it's sort of just almost comical in a way that, like, Okami wasn't there to take the fight. Um, you know, a top 10 guy versus a guy who's trying to get into the top 10, guy in the top 10 is coming off of a loss. It would have made all kinds of sense, you know, um, in terms of all the things that we understand, normal matchmaking and contendership and all those sorts of things to be. It would have made a lot of sense. I will tell you something, though, and I have thought about this long and hard. Do I want to see Okami cut? No, definitely not. Am I happy that he got cut? No. Um, were I president of the UFC or whatever, in a position to make a choice about that, would I have cut Okami? No. At some point, though, I guess I have to admit I'm not surprised, which is what I hate when people say to me on Twitter, what, you, this is surprising? Like, Twitter's a place where no one is ever surprised. It's hilarious. But here's what I mean, and I'm going to go backwards into the argument. There's a lot of discussion these days about why the MMA media reports so much about the business of MMA. You know, there's very little reporting in by baseball reporters of how um, the baseball ratings are, with some exceptions. You know, obviously, there's a World Series or All-Star game. They'll maybe say something about that. Um, but, you know, MMA journalists are, in, in large part, not totally, but in large part, obsessed with the business. What were the ticket sales? What was the gated um, 
uh, get received? What was the attendance? What were pay-per-view buys? What were the ratings? What were the ratings on Friday versus on Saturday for this event versus that event? Um, how much did the prelims contribute to the pay-per-view and so and so forth? So all the things you can measure about the business, MMA media are, are really sort of in on. And there's a question about why. Like why are they so obsessed? Like, yes, there was an example in Deadspin recently where the Houston Astros, I don't know if you guys saw this, I think on CSN Houston pulled a 0.0. .0 a 0, 0.0. I mean, no, I mean, no one was watching. You know, I mean, not no one, but you get the idea. Like, basically no one. And part of that was because of their distribution, but you get the idea. So, um, but it's not really common. And the answer to me when I think about it is that MMA is basically, and combat sports generally, they're basically low to the ground. You know, certainly there are moments where like when I was at the Mayweather fight, you guys know I covered the Mayweather fight for SBNation.com against Canelo. I mean, it was crazy how big that atmosphere was. And I remember I was listening in the media room, I was listening to one of the Showtime guys on a phone with somebody about all the stars that were coming. He's like Busta Rhymes, Puffy, um, uh, you know, Magic Johnson, blah, 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 like listing all these names, just sort of crazy, you know, how big it can be. But the reality is most of boxing is, and the vast, vast, vast majority of boxing is not that way. And even UFC is certainly not that way, at least not that way yet. Um, belts are not even close. The reality is combat sports are low to the earth. And the reason why MMA media covers them the way that they do in terms of having this obsess, obsession over business is because a lot of combat sports goes out of business. A lot of it just dies. A lot of it just sort of turns it up dead. And by covering the business of it, you know, I'm not saying they cover it perfectly or that they always get it right or maybe that their obsession doesn't take them too far into being, you know, worrying about its health. But the reason why they cover it is because they're used to watching things have a life cycle in front of them. Just like fighters have a life cycle. One of the things I've learned all, after all these years in journalism is I'm going to be here longer than the fighters are. The vast majority of the ones that I cover. And that's true about most of the shows too. Now again, I'm not suggesting UFC is an unhealthy place. Not, not, not even close. They're doing great. They're doing great. But what I'm sort of saying here is football, to, to, to round this whole argument about Okami out, football as it exists doesn't have to worry about that. In other words, there's such a high level of popularity that teams and coaches are able to make personnel decisions based on winning because winning is the most important thing. In a sport like MMA and a sport like boxing, um, the reality of the business is that winning is not the most important thing. And that's a hard nut, or I should say not to crack, but that's a... That's a hard idea to accept. In many ways, I refuse to kind of accept it. I don't know that I ever will fully accept it, but it's basically true. It, winning is still, uh, of all the values, maybe the most important thing, but it's not really the only thing. It's not really the only thing. And it's not the only thing because it exists in a much more precarious state than other sports. It exists in a place where you have to kind of engineer it for entertainment because it won't buoy itself otherwise. So the cutting of Okami to run this whole thing about MMA media and everything else, you know, to run this, it's you know, it's not a decision I'm particularly happy with, and I have genuine heartfelt sorrow for Okami. And maybe cutting him wasn't particularly the right decision, but it does bring us back to the reality that we we are we are inside of a sport that does not hover in elite air like football does or like baseball does. We exist in a sport that doesn't quite have that cushion if it comes crashing down. And I think that's why people are constantly looking at the ratings and they're constantly looking at the gate numbers because they're kind of obsessed with it because those tell you what's what's happening with the health. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, an, it's a, a constant doctor checkup. And Okami is a victim of this. He's a victim of this process, of this reality. And again, I'm not here to defend the idea that he had to be cut or, or else... But in the larger scheme of things, when you sort of begin to accept the idea that we don't, we don't have that same level of cushion, um, understanding why he would be cut makes more sense. And again, I'm going to finish this off and I'm going to move to the next question because I've been going on this one for a while. But I would not cut him. I'm not in favor of cutting him. I would much rather see 
Tim Kennedy versus Yushin Okami. But I can understand also a world where somebody can look at you in the face and say, it makes no difference for ratings if Tim Kennedy fights Okami or Rafael Natal, and at least a fight with Natal won't be boring. And the public who watches UFC will be none the wiser. Those are true statements. Those are true statements. That cannot be said for my Washington Redskins. Can you imagine them benching Kirk Cousins or even RG3 and saying, we're going to put in Rex Grossman because he's a gunslinger. Listen, he might throw more interceptions, but at least he throws the ball. He'll heave it 50 yards down the field. And yeah, he might fumble in the red zone, but I mean, there's action there. You know, you would say, what, what are you talking about? But they... Uh, But they, um, but they have a luxury where they don't have to worry about engineering the game to appear a certain way to make sure um, it looks a certain way. And combat sports doesn't have necessarily the same level of luxury. Let's see. So, you know, people are gonna, I know there's going to be somebody out there who misconstrues the argument and says, you were in favor of cutting Cain Velasquez. No, I wasn't. Or not Cain Velasquez, I'm sorry. Uh, you should know Kami. No, I'm not. I'm not in favor of it. I, I, I don't like it at all, but it's, it's where we are. All right, so someone's asking me, what, what do you think of the uh, UFC 166 fight card? For folks who haven't seen it, this is the main, the main card for UFC 166. Cain Velasquez, Junior Dos Santos. Daniel Cormier, Roy Nelson, Gilbert Melendez, Diego Sanchez, Gabriel Gonzaga, Sean Jordan, John Dodson, uh, Daryl Montag or Montague, I'm not sure how he pronounces his name, and then Tim Boach, C.B. Dalloway, Nate Marquardt, Hector Lombard, Sarah Kaufman, Jessica I, George Sotaropoulos, K.J. Nunes, T.J. Waldberger, Adlong Amagov, Tony Ferguson, Mike Rio, Charles Oliveira, Jeremy Larson, Dustin Pegg, and then Kyoji Horiguchi, who is like... Um, like the top prospect out of Japan right now. Uh, the card's ridiculous. It's awesome. It's going to be a pleasure covering it. Finally, a card where I can say that. And um, I'd like Cain Velasquez to hold his title. But I don't want to get too much into the weeds on that one because uh, I have to do more about that later. McGregor wanting to go up to 155 for the Dublin card. Bad move, or will it really shake things up? I don't think it'll matter because I don't think UFC is going to uh, give him a fight at 155. Yeah, I'm not answering this question about the Bellator model. I've talked about it uh, ad nauseum. Machida Munoz, what do you think about this new matchup and what kind of chance do you give Munoz uh, at taking down and Donkey Konging Machida? Uh, basically none. Yeah, um, Munoz certainly looked better in that Boach fight, and I appreciate the wherewithal it must have, the, 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 the grit and determination it must have required to come back from that Weidman beating and look so good and so dominant after losing all that weight, you know? But he, a lot of times, what I've noticed about his takedowns, at least not in, not in wrestling, but in pure MMA, or I should say wrestling in MMA, he has a tendency to shoot into a guy instead of throwing him through him. So like, like you go back, like a, particularly the Okami fight, he'll he'll land sort of on the guy's hips and not really be blasting through them. And I think for a guy like Machida, who's not going to stay there, uh, who's really good at defending takedowns and in the clinch, it's going to be a hard night for him. And meanwhile, I see him sort of getting pot shotted. I think it's a tough fight. You know, we'll see how his speed translates for Machida at 185, but. It's hard to not favor Machida in that fight. Let's see here. Um, UFC 168. In your opinion, how much, I mean, how many you should read? How many pay-per-view buys would UFC 168 need to sell in order for it to be considered a success? A million. 
Anything less than a million, I think, would be a disappointment. But anything over a million is fine. Um, I certainly do not believe that it's going to match UFC 100. Um, I know Dana White's very confident, but you know he thought that the rematch between Silva and White and um, Sonnen was the biggest fight in UFC history. And most certainly was not. Um, although it was a big fight. UFC 168 is very good. I think the main event is huge. I think the co-main event is good for, for media. But there isn't anything else there that can make it match UFC 100. And even if it did, like understand what UFC 100 had. A big-time hardcore grudge match rematch with Brock Lesnar and Frank Mir. Brock Lesnar already a big pay-per-view draw. Then you had George St. Pierre, arguably the second biggest pay-per-view drawing entity in the UFC, defending his title against Thiago Alves. And then you had the two guys coming off of the Ultimate Fighter in Dan Henderson and Michael Bisping. You know, at the time, Dana White said correctly that it was three main events and one card, and that's true, it was. You know, and it, but it's not just that, although that's still huge. Um, MMA was, and you hear me out here, domestically, domestically, MMA was a little more popular back then. Not crazy more popular, but more popular. Pay-per-view buys are not now what they once were. Um, they can reach certain heights, but the average is lower. And that's the same for uh, attendance in certain places and certain markets and gate receipts, too. The success the UFC has had is in A, making MMA popular, and B, one success they don't get really much credit for, but they deserve, is making MMA, and mostly UFC in this regard, but making MMA part of the mainstream sporting diet. When you watch Fox Sports One, and I know they're in the tank with Fox, but um, it's part of that. It's part of sporting coverage now, and even ESPN, they've improved what they've been doing. That, it to me, is a big triumph. It's a big, big triumph for the UFC to get newspapers to cover them, to get ESPN and Fox Sports to cover them in a way where you're a legitimate sport. Let's give you legitimate news coverage. Let's do legitimate specials around you. Let's give you real airtime. These things matter. These things are real. But that's not the same thing, believe it or not, as general level popularity. There's a security in being so entrenched and a key integral component of the sporting world. You know, there's a certain floor that you won't go below, maybe, a certain um, sense that you're, you've kind of made it, you've achieved, a, you, can, you can hover above a certain space. That's not the same as reaching those huge heights. And those huge heights that at the time at UFC 100 reached were part of a climate where MMA was still hot, super hot. It was part of the bubble, to be honest. Um, so how are you going to replicate that? You know, I don't know. I don't know. You need to stack the card in a similar way. It's not nearly as stacked as UFC 100. And UFC 100 also operated in a climate where it was crazy hot. So I think the UFC deserves just unbelievable amounts of credit for getting sporting reporters and sporting um, editors and producers to cover this like a real thing. Like that's a hard thing to do. And it took years and years of editorial board meetings and knocking down doors and sending out press releases and trying to get these guys to come and show them and improving their product and everything else that goes into it. It took a long time. That's not the same thing, though, as being a hot ticket. Are my cats on, quote, unquote, furlough with the federal government shutdown? Funny, funny. True or false, Cain Velasquez and Junior Dos Santos will fight each other more than four times. False. Daniel Cormier will prove to be a bigger challenge to John Jones and Gustafson. True. John Jones will hold UFC heavyweight title within three years. False. Chris Weidman is still undefeated in 2015. False. Next welterweight champion is either Rory McDonald or Ben Askren. False. Michael Chandler would defeat Anthony Pettis if they would meet right now. Oh, that's tough. Uh... I'm getting all kinds of text messages here. I'll say true. I 
don't know. Uh, Frankie Edgar has a chance to be the first fighter to hold UFC titles in three weight classes. False. Dominic Cruz will be a betting favorite if he meets Henan Burrell in February and March of 2014. False. Man, poor Cruz. What a tough shot he has, man. Flyweights will headline a UFC pay-per-view in 2014. That's a good question. I'll say true. Does it bother you that the UFC charges extra for their HD broadcast? If they want to tier their content, why not offer a black and white stream for $39.99 or just access to audio for $10? Bucks? I just don't get it. HD isn't a new technology, and I find it hard to believe that they have if yet to uh, amortize their HD equipment after all these years. I don't know what the economics are behind that, um, about why it costs more for HD. I don't know if it's a, if it's nonsensical. I mean, if they're going to shoot everything in HD anyway, what difference does it make? Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. But um, I, I've never thought about it in a particular way where I was upset that there was a tiered system there between standard F and high def. Uh, more true or false? Penn and Barrow is top five pound for pound. Man, he might be. That's tough. Bellator does another pay-per-view this year. False. Glover rocks Jones at least once in their fight. True. Pettis Benson 3 happens in the future. Yeah, probably. Rory McDonald ground and pounds Lawler to a vicious unanimous decision win. True. Faber wins a UFC belt in his career. I'm going to have to say false, unfortunately. Hendo gets KO'd for the first time against Belfour. False. Shogun retires after getting wrestle effed by Tahuna. Maybe. Boral Cruz goes to a decision. True. Luke Thomas shaves his beard before the end of 2013. I can tell you now that's false. Wait, more true false? All right, one more for now. George St. Pierre will, will retire the UFC champion. True. If Vitor Belfort and Lyoto Machida win their next fights, will they coach the Brazil Ultimate Fighter? Probably. Vitor Belfort will get another UFC title fight. True. Um, Roy McDonald will be the next welterweight champion. False. George St. Pierre will submit Johnny Hendricks late in their fight. No. False. Gagard Musasi fights for a UFC belt. That might be true. There will be a super fight between champions below 155. True. Anderson Silva will fight John Jones. False. Sergio Pettis to the UFC. What do you make of Sergio Pettis at 19 coming to the UFC undefeated without really being tested by any well-known name? How well do you think he does at, against Lee at 135 and UFC 167? I like Sergio Pettis a lot. I have really enjoyed how he's competed. Man, my phone is just blowing up. Jesus. All right. Um, I've watched his fights in RFA. Uh, he's really good. He's great even. I think it's a little bit early for him to be in the UFC, in my opinion. Uh, I still think he's got a lot of developing to do. Not Again, not that he can't beat guys already there. I think he'll beat Vaughn, to be perfectly honest. But... Um, I think he's still got some work to do. I think he's got some issues to iron out. I really like him. I really respect him. Um, at 19, I would have liked to see him get a few more fights on the regional circuit. Maybe to wait till 20 or 21. Probably doesn't want to wait that long. Probably wants the bigger checks and probably knows he can beat some of these guys at this level. But it's, you know, I'd hate to see him get bounced and have to come back. It's hard to do that. Um, he's in a tough division, you know. How fast do you think Hunt KOs Bigfoot? Not very if Bigfoot decides to wrestle, which he can do. Let's see. Not very. Everyone does, sort of seems to forget that like Bigfoot can wrestle really well. Really well. He can level change. He can shoot. Sorry, guys. My phone is just like going berserk. Tough Brazil three coaches. Dana White stated that the coaches for the third Tough Brazil will be coaches that shock and amaze us. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Who do you think the coaches are since the UFC is apparently waiting for their fights to play out? Jacare could be one. Vitor could be another. Vitor versus Leota could be another one. I don't I don't think it'll shock and amaze you, though. 
Like, who's it going to be? You know what would shock and amaze me? If it was like Sonnen versus Jones, too. That would shock and amaze me. But uh, having a bunch of Brazilians on there is not going to shock or amaze me. Uh, if and when Sonnen fights Vanderlei, who do you favor? Sonnen. By the way, you all know that all that stuff they're doing is totally staged, right? Y'all know that, right? People think people keep asking me if there'll be a fourth fight between Kane and Junior. If if Junior wins, yes. If Junior loses, no. No. Is Henan Burrell already the best bantamweight of all time? Not until he beats Cruz, but if he beats Cruz, then yes. What beatdown is the closest thing to a murder we have seen inside the Octagon? BJ Penn and uh, Joe Stevenson. Oh, someone put Cain Velasquez in Bigfoot. That was bad. The BJ Penn one, I think, was worse. I mean, he changed him as a person, you know. Um... Viacom and Bellator. Luke, if Viacom decided to get out of the MMA business, how would they do it? Would they sell it to the highest bidder or sell it back to Bjorn Rebney? Probably sell it to the highest bidder if they wanted to get out. I don't think they have any desire to get out, but um, y'all y'all see these ratings on Friday night for Bellator? They're pretty good. They're pretty good. Um, I, you know, I think everyone rightly assumed after those Friday Ultimate Fighter ratings, everyone was like, uh, this is not going to do well, you know. And even on MTV2, which is hard to gauge anything because it's so inconsistent and who really watches it, it's sort of like a dead channel in some ways. You know, sometimes the ratings would be up and sometimes they'd be down. There'd really be no rhyme or reason about why they'd sort of fluctuate the way that they did. So I think folks rightly assumed, me included, it's like, oh, Friday night, this is going to go badly. Turns out it does not go badly. Even in the demos that they want, they still do well. Um, I'm not sure I have a good explanation for it. Somebody suggested to me it could have been like, because I they I haven't checked this out, but they said Cops was like a lead-in, and Cops is like silly ratings for, um, like good ratings for Spike. Maybe that's it. I don't know what the answer is, but it's doing well on Friday nights. Like, um, it's not doing like amazing, oh my God, but like the last one peaked at in the in uh, above 900,000. I mean, that's these are good numbers, you know. It's a good, it's a great number. I'm not answering any political questions. Um, people are asking about the MMA fighting hierarchy. It basically, without getting too much in the details, um, there's one dude who runs it all. I'm an editor, so I have some role in you know day-to-day -day operations and things like that. But um, the big dog is a, you know you see him right on the site. Uh, you ever seen like um, like look at the next results post that goes up for UFC 166, like the UFC 166 results post itself. Um, this guy named Brian Tucker, and uh, he's the big boss, makes all the decisions basically. He runs the show. Awesome dude, and uh, probably watching this now making sure I'm not cursing at you. But uh, that's it, it's sort of like him, and, and then it goes on from there. Luke, Ben Askren appears to have managed his prize money well the last several years. He said recently that if, if he never fights again, he'll be satisfied with his career. Could he be biding his time until his one-year matching period is up so he can sign with the UFC free and clear? I believe that's what he's trying to do. I don't know that to be certain, but uh, I believe that to be true. I would certainly believe that to be true. And also understand that um, in the meantime, he's doing that Agon Wrestling Championships, the the sort of um, for-profit, as it were, wrestling thing, the the, the wrestling answer to Meta Morris. Uh, he's wrestling uh, Quinton Wright out of Penn State, so he'll be paid for that. He does the him and his brother do the uh, Askren Wrestling Camp. Um, so he'll have sources of revenue. He doesn't need to fight in that particular way. 
and I'm sure, I'm sure he liked the paydays, but you know, he's not destitute. As you mentioned, he's managed his money. He lives in a place where it's not particularly expensive to live. So um, he'll be he'll be good. He should be good. Do you feel that Cruz would be better off getting stripped of his title than being free to take a tune-up fight on his return rather than being fed straight to Burrell? Yeah, I mean, the answer to that is basically yes. Uh, it's from Jack Slack, by the way. Um, I've said this before. When I covered when Amir Khan fought Lamont Peterson here in the boxing match in D.C., Freddie Roach was cornering at the time uh, Amir Khan. They have since parted ways, but that was also the time where he was Pretty Roach was training GSP. I mean, he still does, but I think like I think he was like he had just recently worked with him, and the news had just come out that George had torn his ACL. And I asked him, I said, "What do you think about this?" He was like, "Well, it's obviously not good news, but you know, if anybody can come back, blah 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 blah, it's George." And then I asked him, "Well, what do you, you know?" Uh, maybe he of his own volition he said, "You know, but listen, when we come back, we're not going to go right to Nick Diaz. We're going to get you know some easier fights first. It wouldn't make any sense." And I was like, I didn't say anything to him, but in my head, I'm like. I don't think you know how this works, Freddie. They don't do that in the UFC. Um, the reality is I would recommend that for somebody. I also understand that I don't think that Dominic Cruz is built that way. You know, I don't think he's the type of guy to say something like, I'm just going to give away my title. I think he definitely thinks he can beat Burrell. Uh, maybe he can. I have my doubts about it, but maybe he can. Um and I just, I just think from a, from the perspective of constitutionally who he is, the idea of handing over his title without ever defending it is anathema to him. I think he must almost want to spit in the face of people who would even suggest such a thing. You know, just, just not built that way at all. So I don't disagree that it's not a fair question. It's been on my mind too for all those many reasons. Um, and you know, like getting a tune-up fight outside of the UFC or even in the, even even in the UFC is possible. Like Marquez, after he lost to Pacquiao for the third time, or at least in their third meeting, I should say, um, he had some tune-up fights after that. But what winds up happening is they do them off the radar. Like often when you get a tune-up fight, you're doing it like in a, in a foreign country, Australia or Mexico or something like that, where. You know, you're the star of the show. It's a smaller show. You can kind of do it. You're not really. I mean, some sites will report it, but it's not a big deal. There's nowhere really to hide on a UFC card. I mean, everyone's going to see your fights. Um, I mean, I suppose you could put them on Facebook, but then from a cost standpoint, it wouldn't make sense for some of these guys. So it's really just there's no right answer here, except he's just kind of stuck in this position. Boy, people are upset about this Ian McCall thing. Did you guys see he hates the homeless? Do you feel like Cruz would be... Uh, sorry. Eric Silva versus Dong Hyung Kim. I love this fight. How do you see this matchup going? Do you think either fighter will be a top five fighter in 170 in the next couple of years? Could be. Dong Hyun Kim has been knocking on the door for a while. Silva, we'll see how he turns out. Um, boy, that's an interesting fight, man. It's really all up to the defensive wrestling and defensive grappling of Silva because I don't think head-to-head -head he can match Kim on the floor. Maybe he can. I'm not saying he can't. I, I, I see that as improbable, but I definitely think he can light up Kim on the feet. And I definitely think he has enough scrambling and enough defensive wrestling to make that interesting. I just don't know how much. So uh, that should be really interesting. Um, I would lean towards Kim, but not by much. Not by much. Luke, the country of Brazil does not have a strong wrestling tradition. How would you explain the takedown defense of Nova Nova? Nova Uniao fighters. Um, it is easier to... Well, they have good takedowns over there, first of all. They're having good trainers. They've got guys who can do enough in the MMA space to train them well. 
But the best thing about their wrestling is not necessarily their offensive wrestling, it's their defensive wrestling. And the reality is it's easier to learn defensive wrestling than it is offensive wrestling. It's easier to learn takedown defense than it is a takedown. And that may not make any sense to somebody who's never tried it, but it's a lot easier to, to get your hips out and get digging underhooks and create space than it is to try. I mean, they're two completely different skill sets. You know, defending a takedown is an entirely different activity than executing one. That sounds, maybe that sounds obvious or I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it's like, it's it's almost like asking why is, um, why, uh, how would I even say something like this? Is it easier to clean or cook? You know, <laughs> it's a little bit easier to clean. Um but they're related to the same thing, right? And it's, it, man, it's an imprecise analogy, but like cooking, man, you got to get all the ingredients right, and they have to be chopped up, and it has to be timed, and, and they're using the right equipment, and um, you know, there's a reason why chefs are paid more than dishwashers, sort of like that. I mean, that's an imprecise analogy. It doesn't fit in a lot of respects, but executing takedowns is much harder. It's much, much harder than learning takedown defense. Learning how to dig in underhooks, learning how to hand fight, learning how to create separation off the head, learning how to get your hips back, sprawling, th those are easier things to learn than getting a nice arsenal of single leg sweeps and trips inside and outside and high amplitude throws and single leg that finishes one way and then finishes another and tree top take that. Those are harder to learn. They're much harder to learn. So they, not, again, Novi uh, Unyao has come to a point where they've got guys who can do double legs. But I look at Jose Aldo. What's the best part about Jose Aldo's wrestling? It's his defensive wrestling. His defensive wrestling is the best part about it by, by a million miles. He does have a decent double, uh, and it's good, but it's not like, wow. But that fool's takedown defense is like, what? Because they master that first, or at least they, they master that more quickly. Um, and that's why I th that's why I think you see defensive wrestling as a much stronger thing, which is crazy because some guys still aren't very good at it after years and years of training. Like Carlos Condit, what a great fighter he is, but that's definitely his Achilles heel, you know. After all these years, takedown defense, stopping takedowns is still something he struggles with, partly because of his body type, partly because of his striking style, but you get the idea. Um, a lot of these Novia Unao guys are smaller, uh, more compact. I think it's easier for them to learn wrestling. You know, if you're my height, learning how to level change is hard. I'm six foot four. I'm 260 some odd pounds. It's it's you know level changing through a double is is not easy for me, at least relative to somebody who's five five and 135 pounds. I mean, they can change levels super easy. I have to get way down to do that. It's, it's much more effort for me to do that, which is why when I wrestle, uh, and by the way, I'm not good, but when I do, I like underhooks. I like lifting guys with my underhooks, bringing them up to me. Um, that's that's the way I like to wrestle. I like to get my hands on inside control and then start working the underhook game or a Russian two on one. But um, you know, yeah, Brazil does not have great wrestling, and those guys would not be good wrestlers independent of MMA. They're only good in MMA. But um, I think they've had enough best practices shared from guys who could wrestle. You know, for I don't know how much she's had any interaction with them, but you know, guys like Daryl Golar have been going down to Brazil for a long time. You know, they've got good MMA wrestling down there. They've got really good MMA wrestling down there. It's one thing to learn MMA wrestling as as the only wrestling you really know, and another to learn wrestling as the only thing you know, and then trying to adapt it to MMA. And those guys have learned it concurrently. That's another thing you sort of have to consider, right? Like, they didn't just... Like, it's one thing to be 22 and all you've ever done is wrestle. And maybe you wrestled at a high level. But that's different than, 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 you know, maybe you started striking and doing jiu-jitsu first, but, you know, at age like 18 or 19, you started weaving in wrestling. Well, not huge, you know, a lot of wrestling is just mat wrestling. You know what I mean? It's not even, it's not even doubles and singles. It's leg lacing and, and trying to get somebody off of their tripod and turning them and half Nelsons and all kinds of stuff like that. It's not even, has nothing to do with takedowns. If you're just learning that other stuff, um, because we use the word wrestling. It's not full-on wrestling. It's just takedowns, really. Some scrambling. Um, but I think all those factors working together explains it. But for me, the, the predominant factor is that they're much better defensive wrestlers than they are offensive, and it's much easier to learn defensive wrestling. 
I mean, think about like neither of these guys are particularly great wrestlers, but like think about the Brendan Schaub Cyborg Abreu match. It's easy if you're just going to defend, 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 defend. If I went up to you and I just told you all you have to do is defend, no offense, just defend the takedown, create separation, and move away every time. That's a manageable task. That's a manageable task. But if I said take this guy down, man, if you don't know how to do takedowns, they look easy because UFC fighters make them look easy. They're hard to do. Uh, Klitschko versus Povetkin. I think Povetkin is going to get his brains blown out. I have no faith in him whatsoever. Boy, that's a great question. Daniel Cormier versus Alexander Gustafson. Luke, who do you like in this fight and why? Man, that's tough. Without, well, I, I can't answer that question without having seen Cormier at 205. Because what if he just looks terrible at 205, you know? Not because he can't fight, but because of the weight and the weight loss and everything and the cut. Um, boy, that's a tough question to answer, isn't it? I could see a case for either guy. I could see a case for Gustafson, knowing how he can defend the takedown and how well he can really use his boxing. But the problem is he doesn't really stick it to guys with his boxing, if you haven't noticed that. Even in the Thiago Silva fight, he didn't do that. Um, Cormier might have a speed advantage. I don't know. I don't know. I need to see how Cormier looks, but I can see a case for Gustafson winning for sure. Let's see here. Hey, Luke, regarding Alexander Gustafson's match with John Jones. Oh, excuse me, different one. Gustafson's fight in Sweden. Gustafson is going to get a fight in Sweden, which if he wins, he goes on to fight a rematch with John Jones. I see the UFC putting Gus in with a little nog. He's ranked sixth, which makes it seem competitive, and I can't see him causing an upset. Who do you think he'll face? That's a good one. I think most people thought, thought that, or a rematch with Musasi, if he's healthy enough, certainly. From a technical standpoint, how did you find Gustafson's boxing? I think this is one of the best boxers in the division, and he could have made more impact if he actually stung combinations together when attacking Jones. For example, he was very effective with the low jab, which he didn't uh, have a lot to answer for. If he, if he strung some combinations other than the one strike and back off, he would have had Jones backpedaling a lot more than he did. I believe Gus cut Jones's eye uh, with an above-shoulder jab, which is also very effective. Also, he rarely circled out when John w went on the offense. He retreated straight back, which is a very big no-no in boxing. I think if Gus kept a lot of these simple but fundamental techniques from time to time in his boxing, with his fantastic takedown defense, he, we may have had a new light heavyweight champ in Toronto. Certainly. That was one, two problems I saw with Gustafson striking. One was that he never really found a home for a power strike. That is that he wasn't cracking John Jones with some of those jabs or the you know counter hooks. They were landing, they were hard, they hurt. I'm not saying that, but like a real big sincere punch that he can you know drop people with. Um, that was one. Two was the combination. He he had good boxing, but he wasn't really mixing up strikes and kicks well. He wasn't doing it poorly, understand, but he wasn't doing a one-two like a jab cross upper uppercut. Inside low kick or inside or, uh, middle kick or even going high and low with his kicks. There was a little bit of repetition to him. And Jones, too. You know, Jones is a little more pot shoddy in that way, too. But, um, you know, definitely feel like with some adjustments, if he can make Gustafson striking, could even go even better. Right now, it's a little bit jab and move. It's like it's, it's you know, jab cross, jab cross hook. There's not a lot of, um, I won't call it meat and potatoes, but I won't call it, it's only super threatening in the volume way and super threatening that he can steal rounds. It's not super threatening as like a dramatic knockout threat. It's not like Anthony Pettis. Like Pettis will put you to sleep quickly. It's different than that. And you know, by the way, I was at Glory uh, 10 this past weekend. I mean, my God, man. You know, what these guys do in terms of their combinations, obviously they have the freedom to throw because they're not worried about takedowns or takedowns in particular from John Jones. But... Um, just the thorough combinations they throw. I mean, five, six, seven shot combinations. Legs, arms, everything. It's crazy what they would do.
Um, well, someone's asking a question about Glory. Just as a matter of disclosure, I'm sort of in talks with them for a uh, a very, very minor but potential gig, so I can't really comment on that while that's going on. Um, but know that either way, if I do or don't take the job, and it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be leaving this job. It'd be an additional job. Um, I think very highly of Glory. I think very highly. I think they have a tough road. You know, I mean, you got to build a sport. That's not an easy, easy task. But um, it's a good product, you know. And I've changed a lot of my views on kickboxing over the years. I wasn't so sure about it early on. Not that I didn't. Not, let me take that back. I, I always knew it was a very tough endeavor, but I have a little bit more respect for it now in, in the hierarchy of it. I still maintain all the sports. You know, judo, sambo, jiu-jitsu, MMA, kickboxing, Muay Thai. I still maintain the hardest sport of all of them to achieve the highest level would be wrestling. I still maintain that. Um, but I definitely, I mean, you, when you watch these guys at Glory, in per you have to go see kickboxing at this level in person. It's kind of crazy, like in a good way. Like what they're able to do is um, when you're free to throw hands and feet without worrying about the takedown, the the magic of of all the different permutations of things they can do it just like you know but we'll see what happens with uh, glory I don't know uh, give us the name of the fighter that derails Anthony Pettis could be Michael Chandler um but I can give you the breakdown of Pettis Thompson Thompson's gonna have to rely on his wrestling in that fight because he does have great hands. Uh, and great kickboxing, but as great as he is, Pe he's not going to be Pettis in that way. He's going to have to beat Pettis mixing it up. He's gonna have to, it's going to be a, similar to what Cain Velasquez is going to have to do with Junior Dos Santos. Not identical, obviously, but but similar in that re regard. He's going to have to go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, push him, back him, back him up, you know. Um, and and you really have to work on a submission defense too. But I think I think the key to that will be using his wrestling. Like if you had to point to one thing. Like, what does Josh Thompson do clearly, unequivocally better than Anthony Pettis? And the answer to that is wrestling. He is clearly, you know, whatever else you want to say, but you can have a debate about the jiu-jitsu, you can have a debate about the striking. Obviously, I don't think most people would favor Anthony Pettis' striking jiu-jitsu. Maybe it's a wash. Maybe even favor Thompson. But, leaving those aside, the one thing where there's no argument, who does this better? Thompson is a better wrestler than Pettis, period. Um, I've already answered the Sergio Pettis one. Sergio Pettis looks a lot, not just physically from uh, to his brother, but like looks a lot like his brother. Like he phys uh, uh, the way he his style, it's a little more boxing centric than his brother. Here, I watch some of his fights. Um, I don't know that he's necessarily the grappler that his brother is, but this is what I'm talking about. Like he's real talented, Sergio Pettis. I just would have liked to see a little more time invested in developing some of his skills. You know. Teddy Atlas likes Alexander Povetkin to KO Kletchko. Yeah, I wonder why. Let's see. Uh, okay, with Okami's release, does this not prove that even the top dogs in the UFC can be terminated at will for any reason? In any other work environment, this would scream labor uprising. Might this now motivate the upper echelon of UFC fighters to rally for job security alongside the little guys demanding higher pay? Along the same lines, Uriah Faber, Joseph Benavidez, Chad Mendes, Frankie Edgar, Benson Henderson, Rashad Evans, and others need to be worrying about their jobs. Even though they will beat 90% of the division, these guys may never beat the division champ and will be in an Okami situation where they're just knocking off up-and-comers. Or are we just clearly saying that the aforementioned fighters won't be cut because they are exciting and Okami and Fitch are boring? I think we know the answer to that. I would not include Faber, Benavidez, Mendez, Edgar, Henderson, and Evans in that conversation of people that might be facing that threat. Okami, look at where he was. He's not old. He's 32, but a little bit older. Number one. He's not crazy expensive, but for what he's delivering you, I think there's a question if you're UFC management of value. Uh, very, very good. But as I wrote in my column about it last Saturday, you know, here was the reality about Okami. Again, I'm going to state this every single time because I know somebody's going to misconstrue this and try to tell me my opinion was one thing when it's not. I'm not in favor of the cutting. Were I management, I would not cut Okami. I think it's more important to have a legitimacy to your 
divisions than it is to you know so so clearly engineer for excitement. But I'm not unsympathetic to the idea that excitement really is what this sport is selling. I'm not unsympathetic to that, and I am not unsympathetic to the idea that the sport exists at a level where those are tough choices that management, at a very minimum, has to think about. I'm not uns unsympathetic to that. Uh, to that. But in the case with Okami, people are like, he was 3-1 in his last four fights, which is true. Uh, by the way, timeout. Someone's asking about Rustam, uh, Rustam Kabalov. Kabalov is fighting um, Masvidal, I think at 167 or 168, right? Or maybe fight for the troops? If I'm not mistaken, I think he's fighting him in a fight for the troops, which is better than that main event, by the way. Rustam, Rustam is a beast. I love that dude. Yeah, he's fighting him in fight for the troops. All right, but back to Okami. The reality is, like, someone made this point, like, why is Nick Ring in the UFC and Nishin Okami isn't? I mean, that's bizarre. I'm not sure what Rick, Nick Ring makes, but I think he'd be a lot cheaper than Okami. Um, there's value to him as a Canadian. You know, does the UFC have any intentions of going back to Japan? I haven't heard anything. They're going to Singapore in January, right? Um, but that's neither here nor there. Okami really wasn't going anywhere. Again, I wouldn't cut him, but if I'm trying to put my mind in management's position, why they cut him? Like, why did they cut him? Without getting angry about it, let's think about this. Why would they cut him? One of the reasons why they may have cut him is that you know, if you can't beat Jacare and you lost to Jacare in the way that you did, and you've already lost to Anderson, you know, some other in Boach. It's pretty clear you're not going to win a title again or win a title. Or you're not going to um, even contend for one. I mean, it's highly unlikely he was ever going to get it. I mean, it was, a, it was a show just to get him that first title shot. Understand that. I mean, remember all that? After he beat Marquardt, it was like, Jesus, when are they going to give this guy a title shot? And they eventually did and whatever. So there was that. And the other part was he wasn't even knocking off contenders because it wasn't like he was beating Jacques Array. He was beating some other guys like Belcher and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't think Belcher had a title shot future in him anyway. Um, I think it was that he was just kind of living in that space. He was never really going to sink too far. He was never going to rise too high. He was just kind of there. And if you're going to be there, I don't know if that's what UFC wants out of you. I think UFC wants risk takers not as much as they want winners but they want risk takers too. You know, Frankie Edgar gets uh, gets into a dead end and he changes weight classes. Same with Faber. Faber's done it. Uh, you know, consider the fact that he used to fight a lightweight, uh, done it twice. And then look, look look at Rich Franklin. Like he hits a dead end, he makes a change. He hits another dead end, he makes a change. And it never really goes his way, but he's always creating fresh opportunities, new permutations, changes, movement. He's never just kind of there. And he's also done management a solid any number of times. I don't think there's no there's no indication that Okami was hard to deal with behind the scenes. So I don't think that's a fair criticism. But it is fair to say, like you look at guys like Rich Franklin, they run into dead ends and they just make changes. Like if Okami said he was going to go to light heavyweight, I, you know, would that have saved his job? You know, I don't know, but certainly it would make things to think about. You'd have to think about, well, how would Okami match up with these guys, and would that be good for the division? And uh, maybe he goes back to middleweight when that doesn't go, or you know. It's, it's, you understand, like it creates these new challenges and fresh ways of thinking about somebody that you know maybe Okami just simply wasn't interested. Maybe he just sort of says, "I'm a," you know, he's a huge middleweight, but maybe he says, I'm, "That's what I am. I'm a middleweight, I'm, and that's not okay with him. Then that's fine, you know." Um, so you know, I, I I don't know, but I think I think the UFC, if you're not a champion and you're not on the rise, they'll even tolerate you going down if on the way down, you know, look at Joe Lozon. I mean, who has anything but respect for Joe Lazan? Is he going to contend for a title anytime soon? Like, no way. No way. Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't even know. If he, is he even ranked in the top ten? I, I haven't looked at these rankings in forever. And by the way, like, if this isn't a pure indictment of the ranking system, like, those rankings are just so the UFC can put up a graphic on their shows. And I don't blame them. I think they're right to do it. Yeah, Joe Lazan's not even in the top ten. You know, think about that. He's not even in the top ten, but his job is not really in jeopardy. Or at least we'll see how things go in his next fight. But understand, he's sort of been, you know, win two, lose one, win one, lose two, and sort of been always there. But because he fights a particular way that is good for management and good for the product and good for the show, 
um, he's got a longevity there that is, you know, that all the wins in the world, that all the 13 wins that Okami puts together in the UFC can't match that. Think about that. That's kind of, that's kind of the product, at least as the way in the UFC envisions it. And maybe they're overly paranoid about, you can make a case that they don't, you know, yes, they're very sensitive to entertainment, but maybe they don't need to be. Maybe they're going overboard. That's a discussion we can have. Um, I tend to think that they're slightly oversensitive about it, but not crazy oversensitive, you know? I just think we, it's really unfortunate that the, that the level of the sport, as great as it's been, as entrenched as it's become in the sporting world, all those things are good. It's still in a place where guys who are top 10 talent and a little bit boring, relatively not cheap, and uh, unable to really advance in any kind of direction are just going to have to say, heads up, heads up. And, and this, I, I wrote this in my piece too. Like, here's my message to you. If you're a fan, if you're a fighter, get ready because more is coming. If not tomorrow, then eventually. This Okami is not the end of this road. You know, it's hard to sort of pinpoint who might be in that spot. But, um, by the way, where is Roy Nelson ranked? Number nine. You know, think about Roy Nelson's career. Why is he such a fan favorite and where he is now? It's because he's beating the brakes off everybody? No. It's because he has fights that are really, really fan-friendly. And the UFC is a fan-friendly company, man. All right, back to some true or false. <laughs> Conor McGregor melts down when given to a top five wrestler. I mean top five wrestler. I mean top five fighter who's also a wrestler? Maybe. Uh, sure, I, I, that's, that's true. End of this year, did UFC... The end of this year does for UFC what Tough One Finale did, meaning taking it to another, another level. False. UFC sticks to the strategy of putting big fights after big fights the next year. It's not a strategy, it's a convenience of schedule. And to the extent they can do it, they will. This kicks off. I mean, there's so many misspellings in this. Michael Venom Page fights in the UFC. False. Bellator gives up the tournament format in the next two years. That's a good question. I will say false, though. Hendricks is at top five of most annoying contenders <laughs> in UFC history. No way. Oh, you guys, I love Paul Buentello, but you don't remember his tag? Who remembers the tagline of Paul Buentello? Who remembers? Don't fear me, fear the consequences. Like, what? Uh, UFC is looking at New York Rick. They better. My man's looking spelt. I saw him over at Glory. Dude, dude lost a ton of weight. By the way, he's an awesome kid, New York Rick. He's a really good guy when you meet him in person. He's a really, really good dude. Hardworking too. What are your thoughts on Dana versus the Shamrocks? Tito, Page, Randy, and Twitter Wars. Uh, I wish it all go away. I don't really have much of an opinion on it. Clearly, there's lots of bad blood. I'm all I'm endlessly surprised that Dana White continues to respond, not just to the these guys, but to like fans who taunt him. I can't believe it. I don't know why he wastes his time doing that. You know, if that's how he wants to spend his time, it's a free country. I don't know why he does it, but um, you know, by the same token, like what are these guys doing? I mean, how old are we here? You know, do you, we're going to crash. I mean, Daniel Wright was, Daniel White was right. Like, what are they going to crash? They're going to go buy tickets and sign some autographs? You know, so uh, I wish it all – here's my attitude. I wish it all would just go away. Like, I wish the UFC would just do their own thing and Bellator would just do their own thing and, and we didn't have to worry about this nonsense. But such is not life. All right, let's see here. So I can't believe, like, my phone usually, like, goes dead quiet, and now it just won't stop ringing. That's wild. All right. Boring fights. When a boring fight, in, uh, including fighters like Fitch, Okami, or Askren occurs, people are quick to point a finger at them. Isn't it as much of a fault of the other fighter for not being able to stop the takedown or get back up. And when will MMA fans really start appreciating the grappling aspect and how grueling it is and that there is just not much technique involved in, as involved as striking? 
it's true that there's more technique, particularly in gi jiu-jitsu, because there's just endless amounts of things that you have to learn. And not to say that it, there's not as much technique in wrestling either. I'm not bagging on. I think wrestling is the hardest sport of them all, but um, it is true that there is more technique to learn in jiu-jitsu than there is in wrestling and and uh, kickboxing. It's still, it's still hard to do. Lots of technique to learn. Don't get me wrong. Like a jab is a very simple technique, but to master that, it takes a lifetime, you know? Um, but fans were never going to appreciate the grappling aspect in term, as much as they should. Like, here's the reality about jiu-jitsu. Um, and I'll answer this question about the, uh, because you have several questions here. But one thing, one point I want to make is uh, jiu-jitsu, I love jiu-jitsu more than I love anything else. I think wrestling is the hardest sport, and I respect tremendously all combat athletes, any one of them. You know, we're all talking like neck and neck and how difficult they are and stuff like that. But to me, personally speaking, if you're asking me what I love to do, I love to do jiu-jitsu. I love jiu-jitsu. And I don't even mean competing in tournaments. So I like just doing it. Just get on the mat and just rolling. You know, jiu-jitsu is awesome. It's fun. It's it's hard, but it's tough, but it's great. And it's rewarding. And it just teaches you about yourself. You know, I, I, I love jiu-jitsu. But jiu-jitsu, um, as, a, as a spectator sport, is not a particularly strong spectator sport. You know, fighting, MMA is a strong spectator sport. Football is a, woof, what a spectator sport that is, right? Um, it's, it's much more fun if you ask many people, young women, uh, old women, young men, old men, kids, whatever, what's the most fun thing about football? Is it more fun to watch, more fun to play? You know, a lot of them are going to say more fun to watch. No one's going to really say that with jiu-jitsu. People might like to watch it who do jiu-jitsu or people who have like a basic idea about it. But jiu-jitsu is much more fun to do than watch. That's the reality. I'd rather do jiu-jitsu than watch it. And I love jiu-jitsu. It's my first love. It really is. I love jiu-jitsu very much. Um, so asking people to appreciate that, unless you get on the mats and you feel it and you know what it does for you, it's really never going to come. Again, they can appreciate some things. You know, fans have become more educated as time goes by. They clap when there's a guard pass or a back take, and they love a good submission and a quick arm bar. Those things are fun. Like, that, nothing about that changes. But, you know, there's a limit to how much these things can really be appreciated op without the context of understanding how tough it is. You know, you watch, well, you watch what Askren did to, I um, can't remember his name now. Uh, God, my short-term memory is just garbage these days. Who's the kid that uh, Askren just molly -whopped? Um, um, I can see his face. Jesus, this is killing me. Cannot believe I can't remember this. I've got all the other guys' names in my head. Krylov and Sarnovsky and Shlomenko and everything else. Koreshkov, Jesus. Uh, sorry about that. I can't, I can't even think straight. Um, you go back and watch that fight, and you see what he does to control him like that, and you show it, show it to a grappler, and they're going to have their jaw on the floor, and then you show it to like the average MMA fan, and be like, okay, I get it, he's dominant, but can we like something happen here, right? Which goes all the way back to the Yushin Okami argument. You know? um, now, to answer your first question, when a boring fight includes fighters like Fitch, Okami, and Askren, people are quick to point a finger at them. Isn't it just as much of a fault of the other fighter for not being able to stop the takedown or get back? It's the fault of another fighter is irrelevant whether or not um, fans care that it's their fault. Like, is it Koreshkov's fault that all he could do was survive? Sort of. It's also Bellator's fault for book. You know, I mean, it's the way their system works, but that was a complete mismatch in, in the end. I thought Koreshkov would do better, but it was ended up being a total mismatch. They deserve some blame for that, to be honest. Um, yes, you can give some blame to Askren because the argument can go... Geez, man, like if you're that good, and he is, and you're that dominant, you can't get closer to a finish. The reality is some guys aren't, they're great mat grapplers, maybe not great finishers. Koreshkov was good at stopping a couple of the choke attempts. I think, I think there was a couple of head and arm triangles that he tried to finish, he couldn't lock up. You know, surviving is a skill. Like, uh, who was it? Uh, was it Sergio Pena or um, maybe it was Rodrigo Gracie? Or maybe it was Pedro Sauer. I can't remember anymore. No, it was Carlson Gracie. They're like, the way jiu-jitsu works is the, the first sort of skills, and they are skills. The first set of skills you perfect are survival skills. All right, just, just survive. Just not get tapped, not get mounted, not get your guard passed. And that's tough to do. You know, I can take anybody who's never trained jiu-jitsu, maybe they don't have a wrestling background, just some donk off the street, I will pass your guard like that. And I'm not even good. 
it's just because you don't know what you're doing, you know. So once you learn survival, then you can learn defense, you know, sort of preventing things before they happen, um, you know, breaking grips and learning setups to stop things, and then you go offense. Offense is the last thing. Remember I told you wrestling is the same way. With wrestling, you just want to learn how to survive, and you want to set, set up sort of a defensive postures, and then you want to learn offense. Offense is always going to be the last thing you learn or the hardest thing to learn or the hardest thing to master. Um, so all I'm pointing out is these guys who they can't put away. I mean, is there some blame to go around them for them not being that good? Yes. But it's, you know, uh, I always feel like if you're the dominant guy, you, you're a total object at that point. If you're that dominant, where you're just like, punishing dudes, every effort should be made to put them away. And I think you can make a case, at least in Askren's case, that like he had maximized the limits of what grappling was going to do in that fight. I know he landed 248 shots, but like, did he land 248 brutal shots? Not not really. There's a case if you made that his striking and ground and pound could be better. Um, Okami and Fitch sort of the same thing. Uh, Okami almost became um, risk averse to some extent. Luke, what do you think of boxing's new surge in popularity? I didn't know it had a surge in popularity. Have you noticed that they are using things the UFC has done to make their sport popular again? Also, do you think MMA fighters need to make more personality if they want to start making the big bucks? Boxers are very blunt about the things they say and tell it like it is, whether it's about their opponent, trainer, promoter, pay, or whatever. Whereas MMA fighters seem to take the humble martial artist approach. Do you see that as a problem down the line as far as casual fan interest goes? I have friends that never watch fights, and when they do, it's always the most talked about ones where there's trash talk and major hype surrounding it. Well, there, I, Again, I'm going to keep saying this until I'm dead because I know no one's going to believe me. You can have hype around a fight without trash talk. There was very little trash talk between Matisse and Garcia. Some, not much. There was very little trash talk between Canelo and Mayweather. Some, not much. Not much. And when those fights were enormous, and why? You know, ask yourself that. Second of all, there is no surge in popularity in boxing. Boxing is a little more popular because they have made some changes. Obviously, the Mayweather thing was a big deal. Klitschko is fighting this weekend, and, again, and who's talking about it? Is there going to be a big feature on ESPN? Is Fox Sports 1 really going to care? Are they even going to report the news that when he smashes Pavetkin? No one cares. So it does, it, boxing is capable of huge highs, but it hovers at a pretty, like I said before, hovers at a pretty low space to the ground. So there isn't a surge in boxing. I will say, though, that it is good that boxing has learned from M M MMA, and, and MMA has learned from boxing. So we all know that boxing has, like Bob Arum has talked about it openly. It may sound like it's a small thing. It's not a small thing. When you go to an event, these things matter. Boxing has really worked on their, their live event experience for fans, and, and Bob Arum runs top rank, and Golden Boy too, to make sure when you're in the arena that it's, that yeah, they're playing Skrillex, but at least there's music playing, and there's a light show, and it's, a, it's, it's an event. That's good. Those are good things. And they've done more than that, obviously, but that's just an example. One thing that you know, UFC needs to sort of acknowledge that I think they've taken from boxing, and that's fine. You're not always going to have the best ideas, um, is these press tours. That, that, that uh, press tour for Mayweather Canelo, I think the UFC was like, hmm, if we've got something to promote, we should get on the road and go promote it. I could not agree more. And they're great. They're great. What a great, what a great way to promote the product. Hats off to the UFC. Hats off to the guys at Showtime that put those things together. Um, it's all good. It's all good, you know. Uh, and there's no reason why we can't learn from each other. We're all like, if they're doing something right over there, why can't we do that? And if we're doing something right over here, borrow it. Like, it must make these products better. That's what competition's for. JDS Velasquez two. I'm a huge fan of JDS with years now. And I've watched all of his fights countless times. One of the things that stands out and that made me a fan of his is his intensity. And because of that, I couldn't help but notice that before the second fight, he didn't seem like his usual self at all. Do you think having the belt and dominating his previous opponents in such fashion may have caused him to take the fight too lightly? If so, how do you see Velasquez coping with a more focused JDS that will attempt to do damage while defending the takedown and not just defend them? Well, I don't share your opinion that he didn't look the same. I thought he did look the same. I thought he looked great. Um... Some other people are agreeing with you that they saw that. I didn't see it that way, at least not before the fight. I think he got a little demoralized after the first or second. But either way, um, no matter what, either you're right about that or I'm right about that before that second fight. But here's what I think we can agree on heading into that third fight. 
no matter what, whether he was or wasn't focused, this JDS probably had the camp of his life. And I hope he's not injured. I don't know. I'm not saying that he is. I haven't heard anything. I'm just saying. I hope he's not injured because, you know, if he had a camp like Gustafson had before that Jones fight, look out. Um, I tend to think Velasquez will win. I think it will look similar to that second fight. But I don't know. I don't know exactly which way it's going to go. You know, um, it's a really tough call. It's a super tough call. I think I think Velasquez, or rather, I think JDS. We know how he wins. He wins with his hands, and now a little bit with his feet too, obviously, but predominantly, safe, safe to say, with his hands, right? There was a couple times in that second fight, man, where he would whiff on a huge uppercut, and you had to think, like, what if that landed? You know, would that be it? Maybe. So, to me, it's a tough fight. It's a close fight. He knows what he has to do now. He knows what Velasquez is capable of. Uh, but, but Velasquez also knows what he's capable of. And he also knows probably that some of those shots whiff that maybe, God, like, they came close. And have you seen who he's been training with? Just on the jiu-jitsu side, which probably won't even come into play. Just on the jiu-jitsu side, he's been training with Bouchesha. Crazy. Him and Cormier have been training with Bouchesha. Probably more for Cormier's benefit, given the black belt prowess of Roy Nelson, but still, you know. They, they brought in some heavy hitters for that camp, boy. Luke, any thoughts on what type of numbers the pay-per-view Bellator is going to generate in November? I don't know. I don't know. I, I would be shocked if it passed 200. I'd be kind of surprised if it passed 100, to be honest, but I don't rule that out. I think it's definitely possible. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Luke, who do you think should be Aldo's next opponent at 145? Cub Swanson, Chad Mendez, Ricardo Lamas, or Pettis if he beats Thompson? I would like to see him fight Lamas. Because I think it's one thing to be a champion and put the champion constantly in entertaining fights. It's another to say you gotta you got to give a guy a title shot who deserves it. And I think Lamas really, really... You have to defend your title. You have to defend your title. And not every title fight is going to be the most awesome, amazing, intense, oh my God experience. Sometimes you're going to have to fight a guy who can just beat other guys. And maybe that sucks, and maybe that's unfortunate. That's part of the job. Not every time. You know, I understand you have to push it back. They've already pushed back Lamas a little bit. But I think Lamas has earned it. I, I really respect Ricardo Lamas a lot. I'm, a, I, I'm not a fan in that way, but um, the guy's resume is great. And he's really turned it around, and I'd like to see what he can do. You know, I favor Aldo anyway, but I respect him tremendously. Luke, everyone always talks about how Bellator versus UFC is good for fighters because competition will drive up fighter pay. I disagree because Bellator pays its fighters only a fraction of what the UFC pays. After all, Shlomenko recently said he cannot go six months without a fight because his purses are too low. Meanwhile, UFC champs like Silva, Jones, GSP make millions per fight. Uh, also, I've heard that some prelim fighters make as little as 1K, 1K in Bellator, while minimum pay in UFC is 8K, 8K plus smaller locker room bonus. Thus, I think UFC versus Bellator does nothing for fighters. Is there any validity to my argument? I would disagree. Uh, I understand where you're coming from, but I would make a couple of points. One, um, it's you can say what you want about the Eddie Alvarez situation, but clearly what it illustrated, it, and the Hector Lombard too, and Ben Askren, Bellator is trying to hold on to these guys, and I don't think that those contracts match, but Eddie Alvarez was going to make a lot more because of his Bellator experience in UFC than had he come from somewhere else. That's a fact. Hector Lombard is grossly overpaid because he came from Bellator. So clearly for those guys, that's a small number of guys we're talking about, I understand, but that reality exists. It drives up their price. Um Number one, and by the way, I think that having an organization outside of the UFC that can, that you know, can not match what UFC pays, but can pay competitively relative to the, to non UFC organizations, um, is good for fighters absent a fighter union. I'd rather see a fighter union, but if they're not going to have one, this is one way to get some of that. Two, that 1K, 1K. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but also understand a lot of these guys who fight in the belts or undercards. They may be guys from local promotions who are there to sell tickets. They're not really Bellator fighters as such. So there's that. Two, Schlemenko fights in an organization that is a TV product. I know they're going to have a Bellator pay-per-view, 
You guys know how I feel about that. I think that's for the Eddie Alvarez thing to win that battle. I, I don't think they're a pay-per-view company. It's a TV company. That's what the Bellator product is. It's a product made for TV. UFC Fights is a bigger organization and is uh, a pay-per-view company. They should be paying guys more. I'd be shocked. If Bellator is paying guys the same thing as the UFC, I'd be shocked. That would not look good for Bellator because you'd say, you guys are, don't have the money for this. And it wouldn't look good for UFC because it's like, these guys don't even have that much money and they're still paying the same as you. It wouldn't make sense. Plus, Shlomenko, while a champion, not nearly the same level of a promotional entity that Silva and GSP are. Um, also, there's lots of guys in the UFC who can't go six months without fighting. Believe me. So, listen, could the pay be better everywhere? Yes. Could the pay be better specifically for Shlomenko? Yes. Could the pay be better specifically for Bellator? Sure. Um, but it'd be unfair to, to... Bellator is a competitor to the UFC in some senses because it's number two. Bellator is not the UFC's equal by a long shot. It's not. So, like, you know, for example, people always accuse me. They're like, you know, like, you're, you're way more critical of UFC than you are of Bellator. And that's true. Um, but first of all, I'm also way more critical of Bellator than anybody else. People, dismissing Bellator is not the same thing as, like, watching their product and then being critical of it and understanding how it works and being critical of it, number one. Number two, you can't, like, it's, it's you know, it's, how, how do I explain this? This is not, this is an imprecise analogy, but, like, it's, the, the way the UFC does things has a much more dramatic impact on everybody, including Bellator. You have to be more critical of the UFC, even if you are a fan of the UFC, because what they do changes everything. They're that big, and they're that important, and the decisions they make affect us all. Me, you, Bellator, Bjorn Rebney, World Series of Fighting, RFA. What they do changes everything. What they do makes a difference for everybody. Bellator can only exist as a consequence of what the UFC has done, and that is a, that is a, that is the truth. That is the truth. So, of course, they're going to get more scrutiny, and of course, they're going to be people are going to put their decisions under a bigger magnesco, uh, magnifying glass or microscope, whatever you want to use um, for the analogy. Of course, because what they do matters. They are the marketplace. They are the clubhouse leaders. So they're going to be subject to more scrutiny. We sh we, we're not doing our job if we don't ask more. If you ask the same amount about Bellator that you do UFC, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong, which isn't to say you should not ask questions about Bellator. Of course you should. And not to say you can't have a negative opinion about them. Have one. doesn't bother me at all. Um, or individual decisions they make or whatever. But because of the size and the magnitude and the importance of... The UFC has the best divisions in every division. <laughs> Think about that. Like, the UFC cut Yushin Okami, and they still have the best middleweight division in the world by far. By far. Bellator could sign Okami, and I could say... The UFC has the best middleweight division in the world by far. Now think about that. So, so being critical of Bellator, frankly to me, I see a lot of journalists do it. It's kind of easy. Ah, this is Bellator. I don't care. And then you don't ask questions about the people who shape the industry. You got to ask them. It's not one or the other. It's not ask them and don't ask that. It's not about that. But when you understand what this industry is, is built on what moves it, what it what it is, it is the UFC man. It is. So you know, trying to comprehend the decisions they make, and trying to say whether they're good or bad is a much more important exercise than what fight Ray Sefo books next. It just, it, I'm sorry, it just is. You know, I don't want to end by saying Bellator is not important. They're important too, and they're growing. And maybe this question will be different four or five years down the road. Who knows? I don't know. But if you're asking, all I'm pointing out is the disparity. Why would somebody be more observant and um, you know, mindful of the decisions the UFC makes over what Bellator makes? Because what UFC does matters. It matters hugely for me, for you, for everybody.
a morbid question, but if Bellator were ever to go out of business, which fighters would you like to see in the UFC pick up and who would you like to see them match up with? Um, you know how that is. Curran, anybody on that pay-per-view card, <laughs> except Tito and Rampage. Everybody, if you, if you take away Tito and Rampage, Mo, Newton, uh, Chandler, Alvarez, uh, Strauss, and Curran. There you go. Other guys too, you know, but uh, uh, Minikov, um, I'm hoping Bubba Jenkins can right the ship. I don't know what he's doing. I love Bubba Jenkins, but what is he doing? Um, gosh, who else do I really like over there? Let's go. Oh, 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 you guys know my man crush, Frodo Hasbulayev. That's my, that's, that's my guy right there. Um, Shabalat Shamalayev. The good, the, the good fighters that they have. I'd love to see this. You know, try it out. True or false? Chael beats Vanderlei in their much-anticipated fight. True. Jordan Bros makes the transition to MMA after the 2016 games. For now, I'll say false. Sergio Pettis gets a title shot by the end of 2014. False. The rematch of Jones versus Gus will do a million pay-per-view buys. False. Bisping. It's not Bisping, by the way. It's Bisping. Bisping will fight for a title before his retirement. False. Jenkins bounces back and wins a lightweight tournament in 2014. Ooh. That's a... Uh, mm, false. John Jones surpasses Anderson Silva's title defense record. True. We will see a new MMA scoring system within two years. False. Randy Couture, Rampage Jackson, Tito Ortiz, Ken Shamrock are blamed for Dana White's hernia by 2015. Probably true. Uh, is this a repeat of what I've asked? I'm a longtime uh, fan of MMA and UFC, and while I love watching the sport grow and develop, I feel like there's way too much discussion and attention on ratings and pay-per-view buys. Yeah, I've already kind of answered that. Uh, good question. Bellator pay-per-view, there's no counter-programming. Luke, are you surprised, like me, that the UFC are not counter-programming Rampage versus Tito? All it would take to uh, completely destroy it what is already expected to be a poor buy rate would be the headline fight featuring one of the top, UFC's top 50 names. Yeah, where? Where are they going to put that? Fox Sports 2? It's not going to do anything. Or very little. Um, what are they going to put them on? Fox Sports 1? They can't adjust their schedule like that. What are they going to put them on? Fox? No way. Fox is too, their schedule's full. They're going to do a pay-per-view? No way. The reality with the counter-programming was that was not entirely, I don't think, but largely a function of uh, being on Spike and Spike's schedule being open and flexible and, 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 and something that they could rely on that with. Fox has fixed schedules, man. These are these are guys that have plans, and then once the plans are set, not a lot of room for change. So it's a benefit to the UFC to be on with Fox for any number of reasons that we all know. But there is one of the downsides. There's always no such thing as a free lunch. There's always a trade-off. One of the trade-offs is it makes counter-programming a little bit difficult. Um, I agree that if they did counter-program, it would be hard for the UFC, but I don't think they have that luxury now. With There's many, 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 many benefits to being with Fox Sports the ability to counter program competitors is not one of them. Why, why is Sergio Pettis fighting at 135 in his debut as opposed to 125? Um, that's, his, as I understand, the more natural weight class, right? I think he, he might drop, though. Let me see here. Ah. No, you're right. He is flyweight. Um, well, he's fought both. You know what? He didn't. Uh, he goes back and forth. He'll probably go back and forth. I'm not sure. It's a good question, though. Luke, do you think Jordan Burroughs will accomplish his goal of becoming the greatest wrestler in history? Do you think Kyle Dake could follow in his footsteps? I don't know. We'll see about Dake. Dake having to live in Burroughs' his shadow is, and David Taylor, too, is kind of tough. Um,. But, you know, you guys see Jordan Burroughs has not lost since he's gone to international competition. They call it the senior circuit, so it would include domestic events too. But, like, 
since graduating college and wrestling at that level. He has not lost a single match. He's 65-0, and 0, by the way. Um, so there's that. And secondly, uh, he had a broken ankle a month before. The dude sparred one time and drilled three times before the World Championships and won. You know. <laughs> I mean, two-time two two-time uh, World Champion, Pan Am Champ, obviously U.S. National Champ, and Olympic Champ. But he'd have to win four world titles and two, or maybe even six, uh, four world titles and two Olympic cycles um, to, 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 pa to match John Smith. Yeah, Dana, or, uh, Tito Ortiz constantly complaining about Dana White is just like, I don't understand why he is why he is doing that, why he is wasting his time. All right, one last true false, then we'll get out of here. Uh, Dominic Cruz will defeat Henan Burrell. False. A super fight will happen in 2014. True. UFC 6, 168 does more pay-per-view buys than UFC 100. No, won't even come close. Anderson Silva retires as a champion. Ooh. False. Sergio Pettis becomes UFC flyweight champion. False. TJ Dillashaw fights for the bantamweight title. That, I will say, is true. Do you think UFC should sign uh, Mirsad Vektic? Yes, I like him a lot. There are some good guys on um, who fight on those um, Friday night shows that air on Access TV. Boom Boom Mancini on the MMA Hour said MMA fighters don't move their head enough. I haven't thought about it too much, but that isn't particular. But that isn't partially because they need to defend very differently than in boxing because attacks come from greater variety, and setting up uh, countering doesn't always lend boxing's head movement. No, guys are just bad at moving their head. Mike Easton would be a good example of that. The guy has a really good head movement, and he doesn't get hit more as a consequence. And there's nothing preventing them from doing that. They're just not good at it. It's striking, wrestling and MMA is really good. Jiu-Jitsu and MMA is really good. You know, uh, renal relative. Striking MMA has a long way to go. Condit versus Brown. I think Brown earned it. I think Condit's going to take it from him, though. Question about BJJ and bad shoulders. I know you have a shoulder problem as well. I have a constantly dislocating shoulder. How much of an issue would it be to train? I've been considering getting into some training. It would be a major issue. You're, you cannot train if that's what's happening to your shoulder. Uh, I Last thing I'll say, I was with a weightlifting coach uh, years ago, and um, we were doing uh, decline bench press, and I tore my labrum. Now, I didn't know it at the time. I, it didn't feel right, but I know at the time. And I let it go, and I let it go, and there was a point where my shoulder was falling out in my sleep. So I go and get an MRI, and the tear was like all the way there. I mean, they could have just pushed it out. Um, I had to get it repaired. I lost a year of training as a consequence. Um, it's bad. You cannot train if your shoulder's coming out of socket. You need your shoulders almost as much. A shoulder does a lot of things. Like your knee just goes like this, you know. Shoulder goes up, down, side, side, turns, angles. And if that isn't stable and you're, you need, you're going to be on your shoulders a lot and you need to grab and pull, yeah, you can't do it. Go to a doctor is what I would say. All right, so we have to go. Before we get out of here, a couple things I'll just say. Thank you for watching tonight I, or today. I always really appreciate it or whenever you get the chance to watch. Do me a favor. Give this a like on uh, the Googles and the YouTubes. Uh, let everyone know you're watching. You can follow me on Twitter at SBN Luke Thomas. Um, I doubt it will happen, but if this gets above 500 comments, I will do an extra chat on Friday. Do a, record an MMA beat tomorrow, so be on the lookout for that. We have, a, we have a weekend off, folks. Enjoy it while you can. And until next time, stay frosty.